2008, I was invited by this piper, uh, Thomas Soler, uh, from Germany, to go to his uh, festival to play Portuguese bagpipes. Uh, I remember vividly that it, it's a beautiful place where he organizes the, the event, and when I entered, <clears throat> there was this guy on stage singing bagpipe music with another musician that would be playing uh, with a different band, just making drones for him. And I just, I remember I, we were late, so I entered and it was meet performance and, and I was floored because I never had anything like that. And we started talking, of course, uh, like uh, all musicians do. And, oh, I, I didn't know about this Portuguese bagpipe and you have such a wide uh, reed. Do you mind if I try it on in my instrument? Because I'm replicating this very, very old Scottish chanter. Well, but how could Portuguese bagpipes even be related with early Scottish bagpipes? So we, so we tried it, and he said, um, this is the best reed I ever had in this instrument because we are replicating the instrument, but we don't have the reed. And I said, you can keep it, and here's another one. And that was 2008, and yesterday, or, or the day before, it was the next time we met. And his name, is Barnaby Brown. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Gonzalo, thank you for bringing us here and a, a very warm thank you uh, to, to the, um, the folk music department of the Sibelius Academy. Um, it's my first time in Finland and uh, a real pleasure to be here um, and sharing um, what is, I suppose, I've tried to distill, um, um, well, really since 1997, I've been going into museums and, and looking at pipes. So, so today I'm trying to, to sort of um, gather um, what, what I um, and my um, very, very important collaborators have, have um, learned over 25 years. Um, so I'm going to try to be concise. Um, the, the material that I'm going to focus on today, um, I've got them here. Uh, there's... Uh, um, an aulos, a, a Hellenistic, no, a Hellenic aulos um, um, that may have been made in the, the 5th century BC. Um, and this is a reproduction in Dearborn. There's a Hellenistic, um, a, a theatre aulos with wonderful bronze levers. Okay. Um, um, again, another superlative archaeological find from 2005 um, in Greece itself, uh, at Megara, um, which is just south of Athens. The baby of um, uh, the uh, um, Aulos revival. This is the Berlin Aulos. It's a Greco-Roman find. In fact, we don't have any idea at what period it's from. It uh, could be anything from Alexander the Great's um, liberation of Egypt um, in the uh, 340s BC uh, to the, uh, frankly, um, as late as the uh, liberation of Egypt from the Romans, um, almost a thousand years later. So, so it was probably found in Egypt because it's made of wood. Um, and another wooden... Aulos, also uh, Greco-Roman from an unknown uh, provenance, probably Egypt, um, um, while it was um, while Greek culture was vibrant in Egypt, um, and uh, this what the original is in the Louvre, currently well, uh, uh, um, currently on loan to the London Science Museum. So, as well as in fact, before looking at any, before knowing that any of this ancient. Uh, uh, piping evidence existed. I was going around museums in, in Scotland um, uh, and private um, uh, collections um, looking at the earliest um, evidence of Highland bagpipe charters. And this is a reproduction of one that survived, in fact, in Nova Scotia. And as a result of my research, it was donated back to the nation uh, by the Sinclair family in 2010. Um, so we had the privilege, and I now realize what an incredible privilege it was, of measuring it 
in a private home. Um, um, and it is now, of course, in uh, the National Museum of Scotland, which makes access a lot more difficult. Um, before I start moving through some slides, and I'll move very quickly because there are a lot of slides, and I just wanted to share some of the incredible pictures because it inspired me, and I'm aware that most people haven't seen this evidence or don't know it exists. So I'm going to whistle through quite a lot of slides, but I'd like to begin just by encapsulating what I would consider the three, maybe the three most important things from these last 25 years. It's sort of, there's a lot of, well, at every stage, human beings are involved. And whether they are, no, it doesn't matter how highly trained or how highly educated the human beings are, we're still human beings. <laughs> and what that means is that um, intentions and realities are extraordinarily out of alignment. Your own intentions and realities. And it's really quite humbling and quite agonising. So I've just, I've written down here on a little slip of paper um, inspired by a Finnish sauna, um, um, just three points um, that I would encourage anyone engaged in something like this uh, uh, to, to come back to and to, to, as a checklist against what you're doing yourself um, and reviewing what other people might be doing. Number one, respect for evidence. And for each other. <laughs> it's easily said. It's not so easily done. Two. Circling back to the raw evidence. Again and again. And you need to do that yourself. And you need to enable others to do it. Three, openness. By that I mean not being right. Not being a soloist. But being a learner and being a team player. So, off we go. Seatbelts on. We are now in a maritime culture province. Um... And I thought I'd begin with that because, of course, for Gonzalo's work um, here, uh, we aren't talking about a national boundary. In fact, we just need to dissolve all thought concepts around national boundaries because they are deeply unhelpful. So here we are, um, and I'm going to go off the map. Okay, this is the, the, the centre of, of um, the, the, the Hellenic world, uh, but of course it extended far beyond this map, and you get evidence, important evidence concerning ancient Greek uh, piping, as far east as Pakistan, as far west as Portugal, and as far north as Britain. So we have a culture here that does not respect geographical boundaries. The first item I have is in a museum in Thessaloniki. Um, it comes from the ancient port of Pydna, which is um, uh, Alexander the Great's um, homeland. Okay, Macedonia, now northern Greece. Um, here it is in 1969, um, excavation photo. Um, the better the quality of the photos we have, the happier future generations of researchers will be. So if you're measuring, museum, measuring museum, museum instruments, don't neglect to take the best possible photos your technology of the day allows. Okay, it's very frustrating what, when this is the sort of resolution uh, um, we have to go on. Here... Um, Actually, I don't, sorry, I don't have a, a photo of the Pydna um, Aulos in the museum. This is one of an almost identical instrument that was found in Pestum, ancient Posidonia, in Italy. 
um, in a grave dated to around about 480 BC. Um, and above you see the original. Um, and then there's a wonderful study by Stelios Pseudodakis with superlative measurements. Um, and below you see a half-made reproduction by Marco Shasha. Now you see my attempt to um, get hold of the raw materials, um, um, which involved buying uh, 200 beer bones from a dealer in Scotland. Um, uh, and oh my goodness, we were, I was naive. Um, so the, 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 the unfortunate mistake here was that they'd been frozen on the estate before I got them. Okay, and that freezing process, not an ancient method, um, is probably the reason why when they eventually ended up on the lathe, every single piece exploded. Okay, now that's no good if you're trying to reproduce an instrument in the original material. So, you know, we had to soak them in, in a mixture of oil and, and superglue just to keep the material um, from um, uh, um, disintegrating on the lathe. Uh, but, of course, I did take great care macerating it um, a traditional way, um, which takes time and insects. Unfortunately, this was in Scotland, not in Greece, so I didn't have the power of the sun to speed up the process. Here is the finished instrument made by Robin Howell in 2016. Um, and uh, there it is at the first international double pipe school in Tarquinia. So the Aulos revival is quite a, um, a, a fledgling um, in the world of uh, pipe revivals. Um, I'm going to skip over these bits of literary evidence, but we're blessed in ancient Greek music to have an enormous amount of literary evidence. And, um, of course, whenever we're engaging with material objects, it's foolish to neglect the scattered... Um, traces of, of literature that there are. Um, so do just make sure that you, you're keeping your eyes open to other sorts of evidence because ultimately when you get the instrument in your hand these kinds of things can be hugely helpful. This is talking about Dorian, Phrygian and Lydian and the question hinges on whether these are on the same instrument or on three different instruments? And I'm not going to answer that question now. Another absolute gem from ancient Greek literature. The earliest logos, the very first um, music theory, written music textbook, um, is attributed to Hermione of Lass Lassus of Hermione. And he talks about notes having breadth well, maybe it's time for me to get an instrument out. He talks about, well, the, the first one from Pseudo-Plutarch is, is, is about there being many notes, and from about 500 BC, um, last of Hermione is, 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 is the last decades of the 6th century BC, first decades of the 5th century BC. And the point is that the aulos was the instrument that could modulate, and it led the, the revolution in, in musical practice. It was the most uh, prestigious uh, um, and popular musical instrument of um, ancient Greek culture. So, Pidna Aulos, just a little, um, I'll stop talking for a moment and see what the reeds can do. Because ultimately that's why we look at bagpipes in museums. We want to play them. And it's frustrating to see um, objects inside glass cases.
So that just gives you a little sense of how slidey and slippery an instrument it is. So that's, that's the first notes I've played in two days without warming up. Um, delivering intonation, delivering solid intonation on an aulos uh, requires training. These reeds are, I'm delighted to say, the first time we've actually respect, managed to respect all the evidence. So these are actually made in the right material, which is not a rhymdodonex, uh, but Phragmites australis. Um, and you know, that, that discussion was published in 1994, and it's taken us till, 2000, till 2021 to be, not to use the material that's available. Okay? We just, there are so many assumptions or, or conveniences, and it totally changes everything. <laughs> These reeds are not, do not behave the same way as a rundo donax. And it's just such a simple oversight. Um, um, so, so the material you're using, this, this is so much softer, so much softer, much bigger, bigger sound. A uh, uh, bigger expressive range. It's more scary to play. But heavens, you know, we're just right at the beginning of that particular learning journey. Um, so respect for evidence. Um, and uh, um, you, you heard how loud that was. Well, um, this was an instrument that accompanied fifty singers. Here we are. Um, um, this is the Theatre Aulos, the, the Mega Aulos, um, and it's uh, without doubt um, a professional instrument. Uh, that's significant because the whole boring on this, the most prestigious elite instrument of antiquity, has hitherto been condemned to the lowest social stratum. Why? Because the whole boring divides the octave not into tones and semitones, let alone enharmonic dieses, but into roughly equiheptatonic divisions. In other words, seven more or less equal divisions of the octave. And we associate that with West African balo or Southeast Asian tuned percussion, you know, something exotic and marginalized, an other, an inferiorized other. Now, when you find in 2005, so I've got to put my reed caps on. In fact, I'm not going to call them reed caps. I'm going to call them reed sheaths. Okay, again, this is, this is trying to retrain my brain because we so quickly get into habits. And these habits then perpetuate false assumptions. Okay, so in the revival, we started off calling them recaps. Now, the function of these things is critical. With these reeds, we don't want caps. We want sheaths that, 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 that um, um, compress the, the blades together much further down. Um, and so just that change in use of language alters how we think. Term, the words we use are important. So I'm calling these reed sheaths because I, I need that uh, um, phragmites um, to be... And I put them on the wrong way around. Okay, it's so delicate. I, I've coloured. Okay, so I have a red bit of... of, of um, binding here that needs to go on the low pipe. And really, I, from now on, I would always have a little bit of red on top of the low pipe because I've cracked reeds and, um, you know, when you crack a reed, that's a thousand hours of, of, of effort down the drain. Yes. Um, and, and so, um, zooming on. Yes, Gonzalo. Um, so, so this Megara Aulos, here again, so I'm, I'd like to, to thank Christos Tertzis for this brilliant idea, red on the low pipe, green on the high pipe, um, so that you can avoid the accidents. Actually, the, the, uh, it, maybe I should add that to my list of crucial things. Prepare for accidents um, and breaking 
uh, uh, it's your conting contingency. Um, uh, um, it's so frustrating when you break the only pair of reeds that's really working. Um, uh, here, uh, just a little hazard that can happen with cons conservation in museums. Uh, so this, you see, was filled in, the, the fragment. Uh, they couldn't tell that there was a hole there. You know, the, the, these, um, they were retrieved in an emergency excavation in 2005. Um, the, the, you know, it wasn't, wasn't the luxury um, of, of, of doing things slowly. Uh, they were down, kind of, you couldn't really see, pulling the instrument out from underneath existing foundations um, of a neighbouring building. Um, uh, and so uh, you can see there uh, plaster work that has eliminated um, a hole that must have been there um, on the basis of other finds. Um, and here, oh, this is just a, uh, I popped these in because I know there are some flute players here. Uh, so this is the coile, a plaggy aulos, okay, so it's not a double reed instrument, this is a transverse flute um, that is about 200 BC. Um, from just outside the walls of Athens. Um, and there you see the mouth place, mouthpiece of another one. So the Koile Athens Plagiaulus does not have a complete intact mouthpiece, but the um, Halicarnassos um, um, head joint is there in all its wonderful integrity. Um, moving on to wooden alloy. Um, you have issues of, uh, well, you can see them. <laughs> How you restore this one to its original dimensions is a, is a delicious challenge. It's in the British Museum and maybe 5th century BC. Um, here we have one that's in the Berlin Egyptian Museum. It came into the museum in 1894. Um, I have uh, the reproduction here. And it has been neglected because... It defies modern expectations. We as, or the community of makers and players reviving bagpipes have forever tampered with the evidence. And, you know, it's maybe a bit rich to say, it's, to call it tampering with the evidence, because actually you're forever trying to make a better instrument. And you want to make a better instrument. So the, this process of evolution doesn't really, uh, there isn't a clear uh, a boundary between evolution of an instrument and tampering with evidence. But if we're interested in trying to understand ancient uh, uh, Greco Roman music making, then tampering with the evidence isn't great. Um, and there are basic things to, to modern uh, uh, preconceptions to just sweep away. One is that it, to expect uh, two instruments from the same instrument. Okay, this is one instrument, very important. Singular, singular aulos. Now here I have four auloi, and this is one aulos. It comprises two pipes. And they are not necessarily um, look alike. Makers, pre modern makers, even in the Highland bagpipe, you'll see two tenor drones that are completely different. They were made by the same maker for the same set. And we just, because we're post-industrial, we, we think that, that we presume that, that one instrument, sh that bits of it should look alike, should match. Absolutely not. This one, there's absolutely no way that, that you can make reeds that match. And I've discovered as a practitioner that what really works is to have a nice, short, fat reed in one and a nice, long reed in the other. And that gives me the more homogeneity and a bit more stability in the low notes, a bit of beef and stability in the low notes, and a bit more bend bendability in the high notes that I can really play around. I enjoy that, okay? So we're not looking for homogeneity. Um, and what's special about this find is that a reed survived. It doesn't survive now, but we have a, a drawing from the catalogue in 1894. Um, and that reed design there um, uh, is supported by iconography. X-ray can be very helpful because the internal dimensions of that reed seat are critical in establishing the original diameter of the bit of tube you're going to make your reed out of. Very important. And you can also see the syrinx hole. Um, I, I've got little, um, little um, pegs here to open and close the syrinx hole. Um, and I'll just give a quick, a quick, uh, if the reed 
Okay, these, the, these pipes have a much narrower bore. And they're similar to the Montgomery small pipe. Uh, but of course, um, um, well, let's see. So they need a drink. It's wonderfully dry here. Um, but the point is, um, um, oh, there's so many mysteries. Um, and you, with, with so many mysteries, something from, that's so remote, you just need to respect the evidence. Um, and um, because as soon as you put it in, in the hands of a player, what happens is, is not the instrument. You're getting the player. And, and you don't want to introduce interference. Welcome to the world of experimenting with alloy. Things don't work immediately. And you have to persevere. You have to persevere years and years and years. Come back to the same reads. They, need, they, they take a, you know, because we don't, we've lost a lineage. We, we don't have inherited knowledge. But really, the work, you know, you've got to invest 2,000 hours or 5,000 hours um, just with a pair of reeds that's consistent to begin, to begin to understand this instrument. And um, that's no small undertaking. So I'll put the Berlin Owlet away. And apologies, I'm overrunning. I'm going to expedite. Um, so we'll just skip over the Louvre at Alos, um, uh, because there's plenty on that online. Um, but that, um, I just paused there to show how important these little details are. So get good photographs when you have access, the possibility of doing so. Um, and uh, move to the last instrument that I'll talk about today, the Ian Dahl Chanter. So um, here it is. Um, and one of the things that um, makers have often neglected um, is the, what you might call the azimuth of the holes um, and subtle variations in, uh, in their rotation. And you need the right sort of tool to, to do this. So let's hope this video plays. Um, are Zoom people getting that audio? Don't worry. We'll make this available at another point. Um, so, um, so that was just an explanation from Julian. We made a special tool to make it easier uh, to calculate the azimuths and get them right, because no matter how beautiful your measurements, no matter how accurate your measurements, if you don't then succeed in <laughs> following your measurements in the workshop, they're a waste of time. And I would say that, that, that you know, you could really worrying about decimal places isn't where you should focus your worry. Focus your worry on how good you are at replicating your own measurements. Measure two reproductions that you have made and see how similar they are. And of course, you can overcome this with, with um, um, 3D printing, but not necessarily. I bet you there are other sorts of errors that come in. <laughs> um, and so, so I would say set up controls 
not for the accuracy of your measurements, but for your accurate for the accuracy of the end result. You've got to focus on that end result. How well are you succeeding in following your own measurements? Because we did not do a good job. Uh, it was absolutely hideously embarrassing to discover how far out we were. Um, um, and so it was an amazing... Pr we discovered this when we had the rare uh, um, occasion of the instrument coming back from Halifax. So we'd flown over to Halifax to measure it. Uh, then, eight years later, the instrument is brought back by surprise by the owner in a rucksack and handed to us, uh, present, presented to the museum. But we had it for a few days before it went to the museum. My goodness, we tried to get as much as we could. It was at that point that we discovered that our reproductions were not the same as the original. Okay, so here is the original Ian Dahl Chanter in, uh, under a, with our jig for doing the holes, uh, with a wooden, uh, a wooden pointer in, in order to realign our making jig with the actual original. Things like the Rima. How far in does the reamer go? Okay, you may have made the most wonderful reamer in the world, but if you put it in a millimetre or two too far, what's the point of all that hard work measuring? Photographs. Okay, so that you can really come back to those beautiful external details So don't affect the sound, but it's nice to get them right. And on the base of the chanter too, beautiful detailing that can then be important evidence for make, you know, noticing that the same thing is found um, 2,000 kilometres away somewhere else on the planet. Um, so I've got some uh, um, plenty of, of... These will all be available online. So, so, so um, I've got how many? 12, uh, um, 14 sort of recommendations that sum up from the Ian Dow project. Um, and, and here is an earlier expression of the values that I summed up at the beginning. Um, here the, the spelt out slightly more, uh, more detail. Uh, the collaboration is so important because you've got to leave out of your own uh, silo. Um, the, oh, I'll hold up my hand. I've been, I'm guilty of not scoring very well on, on point two. Um, timely release, making yourself available. Um, Really respecting uh, what others have done before you, because otherwise we reinvent the wheel, and it's just ridiculous. Such a waste of effort when when the work that has been done in the past isn't shared in a way that you're, you don't find it, um, and often that's across fields. So, for example, recorder making research: how do you get that what's been learned in measuring recorders into pipe making, that sort of thing, and bassoon reads. Okay, work that's been done by historical makers of bassoon. So opening out, making sure that what you publish in the sphere of bagpipes is available to others. The interoperability of our outputs, specifically the digital ones. Um, and, yeah, number four, that openness. Because the more expert, expert we become, the more closed our brains are. And we all do it. Okay? So we've got to somehow build in that, that, uh, that protection from... Uh, um, Specialist disease. I think that's quite enough. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a real uh, uh, pleasure to share. Well, I hope are some useful um, um, pointers from from my bitter experiences. Thank you.